Sangha Jodan Soki Shonamla, Janjo Bardu, Dani Kepsuchi, Dagi Jinso Chipa Sonam Gi, Drolla Pincher Sangha, Drolla Pincher Sangha, Drupar Show, Drolla Pincher Sangha, Drupar Show. A great honor and pleasure for me to speak in one of the Jewel Heart Centers of North America and uh, especially one year since the passing of the great Kebji Gilek Doji Chang, Nari Kentrul. Tibetans know him mostly in India as Nari Kentrul, the reincarnation of the abbot of Nari Kamsen of Drepung Loseling. My own connection Loseling with Loseling is quite deep in this life and I also think in previous lives, they say that if you're almost ready for Dharma, you incarnate as a lazy dog who lies around monasteries. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I very possibly had a couple of those. <laughs> I was just going to do it once. <laughs> But the life of a lazy dog in a monastery is actually quite nice because all the monks always throw them little bits and pieces of food every day and they always scratch them behind the ears. <laughs> I probably had one or two lifetimes like that, then graduated to be a Lhasa Apso. <laughs> Maybe in the Lebrong of Kimchi Ling Doji Chang, who is my main great guru in India, or Dema Lobju, who is also a Losaling great monk. Who knows, perhaps even the previous Gilek Nari Kentro. But uh, <laughs> yes, when I was driving up north, when I gave a talk in Chapel Hill, and we we're talking, someone brought up the subject of previous lives. She said, how come, she made the question, how come Western people, Shirley MacLaine and people like, the, people like these who write about their previous lives in books, are always the incarnations of very famous people? <laughs> and I said, not me. <laughs> uh, most people don't even remember my name when I was that dog in Los <laughs> Anyway, I feel a very deep karmic connection, and certainly uh, four or five of my great gurus were all uh, Losaling monks, including Gelek Rinpoche. And the uh, main one, uh, of course, it was Kivya Ling Doji Chang, because when I arrived in Dharamsala, he was the main, uh, main master, living master, being the senior guru of Dalai Lama. And so we received uh, many initiations and transmissions from him. And uh, later, Dema Lobju Rinpoche became, after the passing of uh, Kibji Ling Rinpoche, started becoming more public, I suppose you would say, in his giving of initiations, transmissions, and teachings. And of course, from time to time, uh, Tara Toku passed through town, and I also great Losaling monk, and uh, Gilek Rinpoche would come up from Delhi or uh, come to attend teachings by Dalai Lama or to receive transmissions from either of his two great gurus, Ling Rinpoche and uh, Dema Lobju Rinpoche. Also Trijan Rinpoche certainly was one of his great gurus. I just didn't mention him because he was Gandan Shartse. Uh, this year, because it's one year since the uh, fulfillment of the destiny, destiny of the great Kevji Gelek Doji Chung. Then I've been invited to speak in five of the, I think it's seven or eight uh, Jewel Heart centers in North America and beginning here in New York. And of course, it's both a happy time and a sad time. Sad because, of course, the great master who established these centers has passed. 
happy, of course, because there is a prayer for his quick reincarnation. And uh, Rinpoche, if you're keeping an eye out, we expect big things from the next guy. <laughs> Don't think in your next incarnation, Rinpoche, you can rest on your laurels. <laughs> Dalai Lama's um, demo tukus, the great link tools, and Trijung <laughs> uh, Rinpoche is all these guys also, right from the get go, <laughs> as they say in the deep south there, right from the get go, have to work very, very hard to. As the 13th Dalai Lama, try to reach up to the dust beneath the feet of their predecessors. <laughs> so usually they speak in that kind of modest way. But certainly all of us uh, who had connections with uh, uh, Ngari Kentrul, the gate Kevji Gilak, Doji Chang, should, if we have access to that little prayer on his quick reincarnation, uh, should read that daily either one or three times or seven times or whatever we feel we have time for. The Tibetan expression for that is nyurjung. Nyurjung. <laughs> come quickly. <laughs> Nyur literally means quickly and jung means to come. Arise quickly. Jung also means like to arise. And Tibet had about 3,000 tokus. I think of those perhaps Roughly half were in the Galupa school, the Dalai Lama school. And usually when one of the great masters passes, uh, one of the senior lamas in the school will be asked to write a text called Nyurjung Munlam, a auspicious call for the quick return of the master. The main center for Jewel Heart, or the headquarters, I guess you would say, I don't know about main center, but the headquarters, the administrative headquarters is in Ann Arbor. And so Harmut and Kathy over there suggested that at each of the four Sundays when I'm teaching on this tour, because in Lincoln, Nebraska, I can't go on a weekend and kind of uh, scheduling conflicts uh, requested, because it's four and that's an auspicious number. Uh, on the Sunday 11 o'clock uh, webinar, uh, perhaps I could do one of the verses from a, an oral tradition known as uh, the Trampashi, Trampashi in Yamgur, Song of the Four Mindfulnesses. And this is a song written by the Seventh Dalai Lama, and I include it in my book, uh, Songs of Spiritual Change, which was later published as uh, Meditations to Transform the Mind. It's one of the, I forget the number, roughly 30 mystical songs in that collection. The whole, co and many lamas, when they pass away, if they're uh, well known lamas and have many disciples, and during their life, people try to keep tabs on what they write. And after they pass away, someone takes charge of gathering all the works together and deciding how to put them into various forms. So the, this particular collection of, and one of those forms is usually called gur or nyamgur, songs of enlightenment or songs of, nyam literally means experience, but it's really referring to enlightenment experiences. Some uh, can also just mean song of realization, like uh, a deep epiphany, <laughs> something like that. The seventh Dalai Lama was, in my opinion, the most uh, uh, similar to this Dalai Lama, both in lifestyle and in personality and in his teaching style. Uh, he was a very humble uh, monk, but at the same time, completely confident of his own knowledge and his own spiritual experience. He showed no shyness <laughs> in that regard, uh, but managed to do so without being at all arrogant or proud or seem to be egotistical. Once when I was with this Dalai Lama doing an interview for Associated Press when I was in Dharamsala, 
I got a job as a stringer for Associated Press to make a few hundred dollars a year. At that time, uh, there were no, the Dalai Lama wasn't famous uh, internationally or press worthy back in the 70s and early 80s before he got the Nobel Peace Prize. So the AP would just telex me from time to time and say, would you mind doing an interview on this issue or that issue, which was very nice for me. And I was once interviewing Dalai Lama on a particular subject. And uh, at one point, uh, we were talking about his, about omniscience and the meaning of omniscience, something uh, Tamshi Kimba Yeshe in Tibetan. And, uh, said, and Dalai Lama said, well, you know, I'm the highest Lama from Tibet, but even I don't know that. <laughs> And he said, highest Lama from Tibet. The way he said it was complete confidence, like he didn't have the slightest doubt. And he knew all the other high Lamas, you know, the Karmapas and Dilgo Kenzis and Dujoms and all the others. But he had no doubt in his mind that his realization was equal to all of them. And that he was, just the way he said it was. But at the same time, the humility with which he said it, it's a little bit like, bumping into someone on the street and hanging out hanging out with them for five or six hours having coffee and chit-chatting and whatnot and they say oh by the way i'm the king of uh whatever great kingdom of the world kind of thing or oh by the way i'm the nobel laureate da, 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 da. <laughs> so the humility with which he said it was very for me very touching but also the sense of strength and confidence. So in the same way, he signs his books very often, the simple Buddhist monk. But uh, the meaning of that word simple could mean like has gone beyond all conceptualization, trutral in Tibetan, <laughs> and achieved enlightenment, and therefore has achieved the state of utter simplicity. <laughs> On the other side, a simple could just mean simpleton, right? <laughs> or it could mean non-ostentatious or not overly flamboyant or any of those kind of meanings. But when he says it, it has that sense of both the simplicity of enlightenment and also the simplicity of basic humanity. So me, for me, the seventh Dalai Lama was very, very great for that. And the, the, the text is known as Four Mindfulnesses, Trempa, in Tibetan. Now, this word Trempa is uh, often used uh, in connection with the word Trempa Nyewa Shakpa, which is the translation of Satipatthana, a kind of mindfulness meditation. And in the Thai, Burmese and Sri Lankan traditions, we'll often see the four satipatthanas, mindfulness of body, of feeling, of mind, and of um, outer dharmas. But here it doesn't have that reference. Here the reference is uh, to four particular practices that are, that are central to tantric practice, central to the tantric tradition. Uh, most of the uh, seven Dalai Lama's works are written at the request of someone. And because he was at a time, he lived at a time when Tibet was really coming together as the great guru reservoir, Lama reservoir, in the training grounds of everyone from Manchu Mongolia to Khalkha Mongolia, the Zungar Mongols, all of Western China, all of the Himalayas in Ladakh, Lahul, Spiti Kanur, over to Bhutan and so forth. And so uh, he, uh, he, as the great Lama of central Tibet, and therefore uh, the kind of, you could say, the Vatican of the Buddha, tantric Buddhist world or the Mecca of the tantric Buddhist world, being a Protestant, I don't like to say Vatican, in that we have presently have some problems with the Muslim world. I'm not sure I should say Mecca. <laughs> anyway, that meaning is there that peoples from all those areas sent their brightest and best to the central Tibet, the Lhasa area, Setong area, Shigatse area, Drikung, 
uh, Tulung, these areas, Mindraling, all the all four, all Sakya, all all the five or six main schools of Tibetan Buddhism had had centers, uh, training centers for peoples from all those vast areas. And I think if you went in any of those temples, you'd find probably less than half the people there uh, were from Tibet. They were all from other regions sent there for higher training. A little bit like the taxi situation in New York these days. <laughs> anyway, with Dalai Lama, because uh, he was the greatest, then um, whenever the chieftains from those areas visited, the kings, uh, you know, groups of pilgrims and so on, he would receive them and then they would often say things like, well, I've done this and that and, um, and I offer all the merits for you and uh, to the Buddha benefit of Dharma, would you please write a little poetry, some, a few verses of poetry in my, for me that I can recite daily. So many of his pieces are written like that. One is one, one of the great uh, head lamas of the Manchu Mongol territories. Uh, the Manchus at that time had been ruling over China. Had, uh, Manchu Mongols had conquered China in I think 1644 or something. Had been ruling over them for about 100 years or so. And he comes and he said, well, I've memorized the Lamrim Chamo, which is like 520 folios, like over a thousand pages, and the Ngarim Chamo, which is like about another 500 pages. And then he lists another, you know, a whole bunch of things. And uh, he says, uh, well, I would like to dedicate all the merits to you and please write me a song. <laughs> and so the Dalai Lama being both humble, but at the same time confident, said, okay, sit outside the door and I'll have someone listen to you recite all of them and we'll see. And if you get it all right, okay. <laughs> so many of his pieces are written like that. Uh, but the sum of the four mindfulnesses is one of the half dozen in his gur, which are not written at the request of anyone. Rather, they're his spontaneous, uh, explosive eruptions of his own spiritual experience. Now the colophon to the text calls it umatati, which means a guide to uh, looking from the center, looking from the center. And uh, in my opinion, you know, this, well, and then it says, uh, goes on to say, uh, when Sankapa did his long retreat, and I think that long retreat probably refers to the retreat above Ratu, but I'm not sure, because he did a five-year retreat in the Chulung Mountains, and then later he did another four or five-year retreat above Ratu Monastery. And it's above Ratu Monastery where he achieved enlightenment. And I think that's where he wrote the uh, Sankapa had the vision of the four mindfulnesses. And uh, for after that, it became a, a practice tradition, a very strong practice tradition in the Galupa. It's very similar to, and in my opinion, <laughs> inspired by uh, the Drikung Kargyu tradition, where Sankapa had uh, lived for some time and received that tradition, as well as other six yogas of Naropa up there, and some chakra samvara lineages, and special Salong Tigle, um, Kundalini Chandali practices, Tuma practices. So it's very similar to the Trikunkargyu tradition of the five point Mahamudra. Uh, just drops out one of the points, or rather puts one of the points together with the other one other point. In other words, it puts uh, the fifth in the Trikung Mahamudra tradition of uh, motivation or dedication, ngo in Tibetan, ngo, puts it together with uh, Jangjub Sam, with Bodhicitta, which in this tradition is just called uh, Champa Champo or Nyingji Champo, the great love, great compassion. So I think it's inspired by that and has much of the same uh, instruction uh, transmitted with it through the oral tradition. Of course, that Drikung tradition comes from the Pamo Trukpa tradition, and Pamo Trukpa got it from Gampopa, and Gampopa got it from uh, Milarepa, and so on. So it really is, I think, what in India was known as Ganges Mahamudra, the great Maitripa, 
uh, of, of Marpa's four great masters. One was Maitripa, his Mahamudra teacher. I like Ma, Ma, Maitripa the best of all Marpa's teachers because my name is Maitripa. <laughs> in Tibetan, Chamba. <laughs> Champa in Tibetan translates as Maitri, and if it's a quality, it's Maitri. If it's a person in Tibetan, it's Maitri Pa. You have to put Pa if it's a male or Ma or Mo if it's a female. So I like him very much. <laughs> I'm just glad my name isn't Donald. <laughs> <coughs> and this word tremba here meaning uh, mindfulness or the mind or memory or recollection or something like that. And this is in connection with something known as trempa tang shishin, coming from the Chunjo, um, Shiwala Shanti Devas, Bodhicharya Avatara. There's the one chapter on Trempa, which is kind of mindfulness, things to be mindful of or issues to be mindful of, and Sheshin, kind of mental alertness or preciseness, something precision, mental precision. Sometimes Tibetans throw those together as trenche. <laughs> Especially in Nyingma Kargyu, they often just say trenche. They throw them together as one practice, but actually it's two. And it begins as two mental functions, as uh, mammals, as humanoids, <laughs> of the 51 uh, sem, sem, semjung, they're called mental factors or mental I think what's his name, Gerber, uh, Herbert Gunther translates them as mental events. But the idea is our, it's sort of like an archetype or something like that, you could say for us in our, a little bit like Jungian archetypes, although not completely the same, means our, our brain is, pro, is structured to process things in particular ways. And one is trempa, which here just means memory. We remember things. And for instance, coming here today, I had to remember the address <laughs> and tell the taxi driver. And uh, getting out of the taxi, I had to remember to pay <laughs> the, the little taxi bill. We passed a funeral on the way, so I had to remember that I'm a Dharma teacher. So I said, ah, a funeral, very beautiful, very wonderful. Please remember, we're all going that way soon. <laughs> so trempa means all these kind of abilities to recollect and to bring back. And it's very close to certain, it's very important. So in ordinary life, it's like that. And uh, as a spiritual quality, we develop it. And we use it in very precise ways. And uh, here, we use it in four precise ways. Remembering our spiritual teacher or spiritual teachers. Uh, remembering bodhicitta, the conventional bodhicitta, which is here referred to as great compassion, great love, great compassion. Uh, remembering uh, emptiness, or the middle way, the middle view. Uh, remembering to see things from the middle. Remembering to sit between being and non-being, appearance and what's behind appearance. And finally, remembering that in fact we're already enlightened beings uh, through our tantric practice. In other words, we received tantric practice, we took a vow to always see ourselves as a deity. I was listening to a Dalai Lama YouTube uh, broadcast uh, maybe two days ago from but live broadcast from Bud Gaya and uh, they're waiting for the tea and then the tea doesn't come and then they've been waiting a long time for the tea and finally the tea comes so Del Lama says no time for the tea offering it was too slow coming <laughs> we'll just drink it but remember, you've received, because it was the day after the Yamataka initiation, Doji Jijigi Wangchok. You've received Yamataka initiation. 
So you don't have to offer to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. You just offer to yourself because now you are Buddha Yamantaka. <laughs> and he laughed and picked up his titi and went, Shimpo <laughs> don't. In Tibet, they had a kind of a monk called a dub dub, fighting monk. And their great responsibility was to serve the tea. And it's always very nice if you visit the big monasteries because they always put the fighting monks uh, in line. And they put the smallest ones in front to give them a head start. It's sort of like handicapping in marathons. And whoever gets to the temple first gets to serve all the tokus and geshes and <laughs> at the front lines. Uh, so the tea they get is always a little bit warmer because <laughs> that's whoever wins the race or serves them. So he goes, Shimpudu. <laughs> so uh, the fourth one being our self as the deity. One self as a deity, the world as Buddha's pure land, all other beings as emanations of Buddha's bodhisattvas, dakas, dakinis. So in the five point Mahamudra, coming that Sankapa received from Drikung. These four are there. It's just the fifth is given special attention in Drikung, which is Ngo or motivation. But I think Sankapa decided that no need to put that apart as a separate one, because if you have if you're practicing Tantra, your bodhicitta should already be strong. So you shouldn't have to be reminded <laughs> about motivation. It should be your second nature. So, Kebje Gilek Doji Chang received uh, this transmission twice. He said in his own commentary, the four mindfulnesses, which is an edited, edited um, um, ver transcript from his teaching on it, once when he was younger and once in Delhi in the 1980s. I was present at that teaching in the 1980s. And they used my translation, not Jeffrey Hopkins. <laughs> well, Dobum Tuku came to me, who was the uh, uh, director of Tibet House at the time, and he was, I had worked with him a lot to translate many different uh, Dalai Lama speeches when he was Dalai Lama's main secretary in, uh, before going to Tibet House. And he wanted a translation which was in kind of an easier language, or a sort of like a prettier language, I guess you would say. Uh, Bob Thurman once said to me, Glenn, I really admire your position, because Jeffrey and I, being academics, we have to be very, very careful how we translate everything, or we can draw a lot of fire from all the other academics around the world. But because you are not working for any institution, you can translate these things however you like. <laughs> and it is true that if you are an academic, you must follow us. You must be more literal and epistemologically correct. And sometimes, in my opinion, that goes too far. And uh, sometimes it really forces, like the Tibetans, use, if you read Tibetan poetry in particular, they use a lot of artificial structures, as we do in English, to beautify the verse. And if you translate the words literally, you lose the structure, because the languages don't work the same. So we have things like, say, Alex Berzin, in, who now lives in Berlin, uh, who lived in Darmstadt, was part of my class back in 1972. And uh, he translates Kebdra, which most people translate as refuge, as going for a safe and sound direction. Or you have someone like uh, Herbert Gunther, wonderful translator, probably the most qualified uh, first, first Western person to be a qualified translator of Tibetan text, to really understand Dharma really, really deeply and really precisely translates the word jangjub as limpid awareness and consummate perspicacity. <laughs> I go to, until I achieve the state of uh, limpid awareness and consummate perspicacity, I turn, I turn to a safe and sound direction <laughs> of the Buddhist bodhisattva, Buddhist dharma and sangha. 
So there is that problem, though, if one is, um, you know, if you are, if your uh, income is tied to a salary from an institute and the grants you get come from uh, institutions that really you, you have to kind of follow a particular kind of literal uh, present, literal way of presenting things. And so, anyway, Bob had, Bob had a, um, a Tenzin term of Bob Thurman, who I think is one of the most wonderful, wonderful uh, Western Buddhists. And uh, certainly I think he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize, but, you know, they didn't ask me. <laughs> He's really, really wonderful. He uses many uh, also very creative terms rather than literal terms later on in, in his career uh, as he got a little older and felt a little, little less vulnerable to the slings and arrows of the outrageous behaviors of other academics backbiting and criticizing one another. So anyway, I was very honored that they used my translation from my songs of my books, Songs of Spiritual Change. By the way, I did that book. Uh, all my early books I translated uh, by working with a young Tibetan who know, knew uh, reasonably good English and always under the guidance of a qualified Geshe or Rinpoche, and often checking the most difficult points with other high lamas. At those times in India, it was very easy. Ling Rinpoche, Trees and Rinpoche were all there. And of course, I had the great honor of Ling Rinpoche writing the actual foreword to that book. But, uh, and I think it was one of the last ones he wrote uh, in, him, in his life. Most people were a little shy to ask him because he was kind of a little bit of a, yeah, what? You want what? What? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, and so um, of those four, and then uh, the, the, the administrative office so I was setting up my, the Jewel Heart segment of my American tour asked if, because I'm doing four Sundays, doing weekends at four places, one of them being Sunday, if I would do the Sunday 11 to 12 webinar uh, talk from on each from one of those four. And so yesterday, Mark mentioned that today I would do the one on the mindfulness of the guru. And otherwise, with uh, any of these four, could go almost with any topic. Uh, it's common to teach them in the way they're lined up by the seventh Dalai Lama. The, by the way, the first Panchen Lama, uh, by the Chinese and by modern, peop modern people in Tibet called the fourth Panchen Lama, uh, also wrote a commentary to it. Perhaps the first Galugpa commentary, I couldn't say. I should think that Gyawa Winsapa, the crazy yogi of Wen, <laughs> who is actually the first Panchen Lama's predecessor. So the first Panchen Lama wasn't actually a Panchen Lama. He was actually enthroned as the reincarnation of Gyawa Wensapa, who Wensapa wrote in one of his books, before me there was Milarepa, today there's me. <laughs> <laughs> he did 14 years of meditation and achieved full enlightenment and manifested the complete glory of the Gandan uh, tradition of combining sutra and tantra in such a way as to carry an individual from normalness to super paranormal lucidity. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so yes, uh, so at that uh, teaching by Ling Rinpoche, uh, Kevji Gelek Rinpoche was there and it was very sweet to see him because he, uh, Tibet House had a little guest room, which is a really a little two room apartment for visiting lamas. I had attended quite a few teachings there because once a year after Dobom Tuku became the Ginzen, the director, he would invite a high lama every year to do a two week teaching. And sometimes those two weeks would just be twice a week or <laughs> three times a week, something like that. So I think the first one was Sakya Tizen, which was very, very wonderful. And I received Zampa Shitral from him, the Sakya sort of Lamrim tradition of, tran of um, transcending the four, the four 
tethers, the four things that hold you down. <laughs> and the second was, I think, Kepti Ling Doshi Chang, giving this Umatatri, a guide to the middle way by means, learning to live seeing straight down the middle <laughs> by means of maintaining the four mindfulness. Mindfulnesses of your teacher, mindfulness of a bodhicitta for all beings, mindfulness of emptiness and appearance, mindfulness of your already enlightenment nature in the form of mandala deity, of your personal practice, something like that. And uh, Kevin Ling Doji Chang, I think, did like one each day. I think the first day he kind of spoke in general about um, the tradition, and the next day addressed more the guru yoga part, and the next day the bodhicitta part, and so on, for the, for the five, five or six days. And when I first received that tradition, of course, it was when translating the book. And as I mentioned, where I always worked with another, uh, with a young Tibetan who knew, who knew reasonable English and reasonable Dharma, and a great Lama whose understanding of the tradition was impeccable. So for me, translating in Dharma in those days was very wonderful because um, I was once when I kept Jay um, Changla Ratu Rinpoche, who's now 90 something, lives in New York. You know, when I came to New York um, in 78, I had to visit. Um, my mom was, uh, had a life-threatening situation, so I thought I'd better fly over quickly, visit her, and go back during the winter break. And I was with Chungla, and I said, you know, what's the best and the worst <laughs> living in the West? And I don't remember what he said for the best, but he said, for the worst, there's nobody like Ling Rinpoche or Trijan Rinpoche that when you uh, have any point of doubt in your practice or in something you're reading or studying, nobody you can phone up for a clarification. <laughs> and it's true because um, I think the greats, including Dalai Lama and Ling Rinpoche, Trijan Rinpoche, until they died, they continued to always receive new, new transmissions and um, study, uh, study other sort of lineages of ways of doing things, even long after their enlightenment. You know, um, my own belief is Dalai Lama achieved enlightenment in 1967. <laughs> he hinted that when I had an interview with him once. <laughs> In Buddhism, you're not allowed to say, I'm an enlightened being. But you're allowed to hint very subtly to someone who will never tell anyone that you hinted. <laughs> Except you're allowed to tell Irishmen, because if you tell an Irishman, of course, then uh, <laughs> it's like throwing a rubber ball into a <laughs> basketball court. It keeps bouncing and bouncing. But even long after that, with every old lama, he would keep summoning to receive this lineage and that lineage and this text and that text. And even lamas who, it was almost embarrassing to other Tibetans that he was inviting someone like that, because it's like someone who isn't really well learned or well practiced, but someone who was the only living person who held the oral tradition from a particular important text or important tradition, and he would send out to wherever they were and say, please come to <laughs> Dharmsala and, and transmit that to me. And nobody had ever heard of that guy. They think, that's not like a Dilgo Kenze or a Dujum or a you know, Dejung Rinpoche or a Ling Rinpoche. It's like, you know, Joe Schmlo from down the block. <laughs> and so uh, Kipji uh, Rato Rinpoche was saying, you know, that for him, when he came over, I mean, you know, this is like 40 years ago or 50 years ago when he was still a young man of 40 or something, <laughs> that uh, for him, the great difficulty living here was not having anyone to check difficult dharma points with when he was doing practice or when he was doing studies of particular, readings on particular practices. And living in Dharmsala was very wonderful. And we, we had great, I had great fortune with this, 
that one of the very wonderful Ganda and Shartse Geshe's was sick <laughs> and in hospital. <laughs> and the hospital was right behind my little apartment in Dharamsala. And I heard he was there and I went over and visited him and he wasn't like contagiously sick, but he would be there for like six or eight months taking treatment and just sort of resting, relaxing. And, and so, you know, just sitting on his hospital bed doing mantras and meditations and taking little walks. So I said to him, Geshe La, it would be very wonderful if like maybe three times a week I could come over and bring over a Tibetan text and we could like read through it together. And so that was very, and when I started and he looked at it, he said, well, if you showed this to 10 different lamas, you get 10 different readings of s several of the verses because being in verse, they're purposely abstract. So we did the basic reading with him and then for the final reading, ran up to Kivji Ling Dozhi Chung and had him sort of clarify a couple of little points that we were unsure of. And uh, Losang Sonoma later uh, ended up tra translating at the Tibetan Library, which was very nice. I met him in Sanarnat when he was a monk in the Tibetan Institute there. Later ended up going to Australia, New Zealand, and he himself is down there, has translated and published a half a dozen books on Dharma. So uh, me doing some things with him to learn, improve my Tibetan and write in English benefited me a lot. And I think, I hope that my doing it with him also helped and benefited him a lot. Now, I would, uh, I could read Jeffrey's literal translation, but maybe I won't. <laughs> and just to say a few things about the mindfulness of the guru. On the, on the throne of unchanging method and wisdom, unchanging her girme in Tibetan, when we achieve enlightenment, uh, and I say we and when, not if. <laughs> In the Buddhist world, it's said that all beings are evolving towards enlightenment. Even Donald Trump one day will be the best Buddha he knows. <laughs> and uh, that when we achieve, it's called unchanging method and wisdom because it's always perfect. That is to say, the understanding. I think this is a little bit linked to the idea of the 10 bodhisattva levels. You know, from the beginning of our practice, um, we start by bringing together method and wisdom, and the method being the first three, three paramitas of generosity, ethics, and joyous, joyous living, <laughs> joyous activity and the six being the wisdom side of things, and the other two can go either way depending on uh, how you're, what's happening with them. So the, yeah, so you're right, yeah. So yeah, generosity, sort of discipline or ethics, and gentleness, forgiveness, patience, whatever we want to call it. And uh, Tisha says in his Lam Dun that really the first five are method and the last is wisdom. But in the commentaries, it usually says that's in a kind of a final way of thinking about things. But in terms of reality, when uh, effort and meditation also go together with emptiness as a kind of a wisdom factor when they're all conjoined. And of course, another way is that when you practice one six, one paramita, you practice all six. So in fact, they're always together to some extent. But here they're called unchanging, which means when they're all, when they are in perfect, 100% balance. And as I was saying, I think the reason that term is used is because when we achieve aryaship, when we become an arya, achieve the first bodhisattva bhumi and have the first direct non-conceptual experience of emptiness in meditation or the ultimate reality of things, we become an Arya, equal to Arya Avalokiteshvara at the moment he did that, or <laughs> you become a saint, <laughs> a pakpa in Tibetan. And when you're in meditation, you have complete wisdom, complete experience of emptiness. Uh, and But when you come out of it, then you're in conventional reality and you get up from your, th your 
meditation seat and you have to walk in back into the Oval Office and decide what to do about the uh, 30,000 immigrants and <laughs> presuming that the Donald is an Arya. <laughs> But whatever it is we get up from and go back about our life doing, that becomes method, upaya. That becomes the environment in which method becomes a principal factor at play. And the ten bodhisattva bhumis, sa chu, sa chu in Tibetan, those ten bodhisattva bhumis basically are, in Tibetan they're called Gomlam, the path of meditation, but meditation there doesn't mean meditation, it means integration. Each time when you go into emptiness meditation, you carry a little more of the conventional reality, and when you come back to conventional reality, you carry a little more of emptiness. And then you attain the 10th Bodhisattva Bhumi, and then the 11th Bodhisattva Bhumi, which is Buddhahood. And I think only Kalachakra have I seen the expression 11th Bodhisattva Bhumi uh, being used to refer to Buddhahood. But it's possible that somewhere else I haven't personally seen it, seen that reference. So when we say 11th Bodhisattva Bhumi or unchanging method in wisdom, it means enlightenment. So wisdom and conventional bodhicitta with no duality in every situation, always in rochikpa, one flavoredness, sits the kind guru, Katrin Lama. And kind there doesn't mean he's a nice guy, because uh, we have many gurus who are grumpy and a little tough. Uh, the 13th Dalai Lama was very tough. Charles Bell once said to him, how come you're so tough to Tibetans? You're very nice to me all the time, but you're very tough to Tibetans. He said, when I, uh, well, even though I'm this tough to them, they only do half of what I say. And if I weren't this tough, they would do even less of what I say. <laughs> and uh, so some lamas are very tough in the way they train their students. And they can be very gentle with some students and very tough with other students. Like one of my favorite gurus in Dharamsala was Namgyal Kensa Rinpoche. Uh, and he had been the abbot of uh, Namgyal for 14 years, and before that, the abbot of the Gyume Tantric College. And he was very, very elderly, but he was very famous for keeping a, a tea plunger for the big dungmos, which has got a long stick at one end, at the end, other end has sort of like as a gas piston kind of thing to churn the tea up and down with. And if he was only a little bit irritated at one of the students, he'd hit him with this side, but if he thought the student really needed more spurring towards enlightenment. He'd turn it around and clunk them with the big side. <laughs> I, asked, I once said to him, Rinpoche, like you're so, you have this kind of reputation. You have always been very, very kind and gentle with me. And I was expecting to say something like, well, you know, it's because you don't need that sort of thing. You're like as ripe as a ripe tomato could be. <laughs> He said, oh, if I hit you with a stick, you said you wouldn't come back. <laughs> so the kind mean, has the meaning of beneficial. Kind is beneficial. Synthesis of all objects of refuge. Synthesis is ngo, I think, here in Tibetan, if I recollect the Tibetan correctly. Ngo really means essence or something like that in nature. And Jeffrey translates it, I think, as the entity of, which to me is a little bit of an odd word, entity. I'm not sure what an entity is. Uh, but uh, ngo is a very common expression used for the guru. And, and, and also they use it so it's not wrong. Semgi ngo, the essence of one's own mind, to mean something like the Buddha nature of one, your own mind. But here it's, uh, you know, all the Buddhas, past, present, and future, the ten directions. The only one you get is your guru. The other guys are hanging out goodness knows where. The ones of the past are hanging out in the past. The ones in the future are hanging out in the future. <laughs> and the ones of the present don't show up. <laughs> your guru becomes the embodiment of those. And so in that way, it's that your guru is really the window 
to the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. By mean, because of the Buddhas and by means of the Buddha, uh, by means of your guru, because of your guru, you get to establish a direct telephone line to all Buddhas, past, present, and future. Pabanka, in one of his uh, texts, writes, the, one's own Lama is more kind than all Buddhas, past, present, and future. Uh, you don't have the karma to connect directly with all the Buddhas, past, present, and future. You have the karma to connect with your guru. And another way, another text says um, the guru is kind of like an ambassador of the king. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are like the kings, and the, uh, the gurus are like the ambassadors in that they are the access point. By means of the gurus, our guru, we, we make direct link with Buddha's past. So see him as a Buddha both transcended and realized. So this word pong tok in Tibetan, and Jeffrey for pong uses abandonment and tok, realization. Abandonment, for me, abandonment is a little bit of a difficult word, unless like an abandoned child, uh, an abandoned, your, your, your wife or your husband abandons you. <laughs> it's a little bit of a difficult term in my mind, not a pretty word. You know, when I started uh, writing, uh, there was a wonderful book around on English called Yes Words, No Words. Some words have very positive resonances, and other words say exactly the same thing literally, but do not have such a positive resonance. So that's kind of the underlying resonant resonance or emotional um, melody of a word um, becomes important in communication. I think that's why everyone loved Bill Clinton so much. He was one of those people who really could link into the emotional resonance of words. Other people would say exactly the same thing. Hillary would say exactly the same speeches as him, but couldn't tap into that emotional reference of words. So here, transcended. The word pongwa in Tibetan literally means to drop or leave behind. And transcend, of course, means to go above. So um, I like the word transcend. Firstly, because it's just two syllables, transcend, and abandonment in poetry. Four, four syllables is always more complicated. Translating Tibetan poetry isn't easy because most Tibetan words are one or two or at most three syllables, and many Tibetan words are three, four, or five syllables. So, you know, people like Donald Trump would be good at Tibetan poetry because he almost always speaks in one or two syllables. <laughs> Although he's not, his sense of emotional resonance of words is somewhat lacking, I think. He, he needs to work on that. See him as the Buddha both transcended as realized. So this quality, not thinking he has faults with pure vision, turn to him. Not allowing negative thoughts to arise, turn to him with devotion. And so, this, not thinking he has faults. Uh, this is a big point in Tantra, and we only see it uh, really in Sutra as preparation for Tantra. In Tantra, I should see myself as a Buddha, you as a Buddha, and the world as a paradise. So to see my guru with faults would be a little bit odd. <laughs> so it's not like a, only the guru is seen as not having faults in Tantra. All beings are, should be seen as not having faults in Tantra. But of course, the guru plays a special role, the lama plays a special role in our life. So we should give some special attention to not seeing faults in the lama, in our lama. And uh, you know, all the Lam Rim texts speak on this in uh, quite, a, quite elaborate ways. Uh, one thing, of course, is when we, are, when we are in a bad mood, we tend to take it out on someone else. <laughs> and so when we get in a bad mood, uh, you know, we kick our dog or shout at our kids or our wife or husband or, you know, go outside and punch the sky. <laughs> but we should be careful, more careful doing that 
with our lama than we are, say, with the dog or the wife or the husband or the sky because of the spiritual relationship. It's kind of a something very special. And the other thing is when we're looking for enlightenment, we don't know what enlightenment is and therefore we don't know what is a fault and what is a quality. So books like the Uttara Mahayana Sutra Alamkara describe, I think it's eight qualities we should look for in a teacher. None of them say he should not have any faults. Because <laughs> who's to say what a fault is? For instance, Tibetans think slurping your soup in a restaurant is a compliment to the chef. When the Gyuto went to London for the first time and 30 of them first did the deep throat singing to bless the soup, they almost scared everyone else in the restaurant. And then when they slurped their soup, 30 monks slurping the soup very loudly as a compliment to the chef totally shocked the Brits who, my mother was British, you hold the spoon like this, scoop the soup out this way and very quietly turn it into your mouth. <laughs> so what is and what isn't a fault is very much a personal, uh, cultural thing. We can never really tell what is and what isn't a fault. And so it should be something that if we do see things in, in our teachers that we don't especially like, then we have to learn to deal with it in however way we can. As the Dalai Lama said in his commentary to another of my books, Alamrim Ser Shunma, Essence of Refined Gold, if you find your guru appears in your mind with too many faults, then you should um, quietly and politely excuse yourself from the relationship, but give thanks for everything you have ever learned from him or from her, and go on and find a different teacher. That's, that's always the possibility. Um, but in general, if you stay with the teacher, it is good to understand that what you're doing is trying to get the Dharma, not have a best friend or a best buddy or anything along those lines. And, uh, and Geshe Ngawang Darge, when he gave us one, our first Lamrim teaching, he said it's like uh, the looking for uh, a musk, the hunter of a musk deer wants the musk, doesn't care if the deer is pretty or not pretty, uh, tall or short, fat or skinny, fashionable or unfashionable. The key point is if the, uh, if the key point is getting the musk. So in that way, we want the musk of Dharma from our teachers and if we keep the mind uh, on the positive relationship. So this is called a mindfulness because our guru is in some way a portal to all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, a portal to our Dharma practice. Uh, most uh, practitioners of Tibetan Buddhism, you get up in the morning, you do Tentrok Lame Naljor, it's called the six session guru yoga. In the sky in front of me, Dungi Nangar Trivenyi Desen on a lotus, and <laughs> sun, on a sun moon lotus throne is my guru sitting, Vajradhara with consort and so on. One imagines the guru appearing in the sky and one makes offerings and prayers and says, help me make today meaningful, inspire me to practice well all day and be a great human being. And the guru comes to you and dissolves into your body, um, melts with your body, speech and mind. And throughout the day, you hope that inspira inspiring thought that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of ten directions have mixed with every molecule or every cell of your body. <laughs> and every word you say will ring with the mellifluence <laughs> of the 60 qualities of uh, Sambhogakaya or Supreme Nirmanakaya. And that your thought will always, your mind will always rest in Dharmakaya radiance, uh, emanating Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya forms in order to benefit the world throughout all of your activity. And the, the third Dalai Lama, when he died, uh, traveled and, he traveled and taught a lot for the last 40 years of his life, and someone said, you're never tired. You no, you must be very tired having done so much. And he said, well, people say that, but I always just rest my mind in the clear light dharmakaya of the moment of sleep. So wherever I go, it's almost like I'm sleeping, completely restful. And whatever I do, it's just like emanating dreams. <laughs> so when we do guru yoga well, it means remembering 
that it's by means of the portal to the Buddhas of the Ten Directions, and past, present, and future. Our gurus represent that. And in that way, uh, we have a direct access wherever we are on the planet at any time to stay in touch with that universal force of enlightenment mind and enlightenment energy. After Milarepa finished his uh, training under Marpa, he went into many solitary retreats, the first down near Tingri, which is a very beautiful, beautiful cave overlooking one of the valleys just uh, to, on the Everest side of uh, Tingri. And then uh, went from there to another three-year retreat and in fact never saw Marpa again. But every day, every morning, he did the guru yoga practice of Vajradhara in the sky <laughs> and would think of Marpa coming and coming to his head and dissolving into his body and infusing every cell of his body and every emotion and every thought. And of course, the pure radiance of his soul with the three kayas, the, the three dimensions of enlightenment. And in that way, always practiced mindfulness of the guru. So I should stop there. Um, we've run out of our, our time. I'd like to thank anyone who's tuned in <laughs> over the webinar to, for tuning in. I hope something I said uh, was beneficial for you. And uh, if you do have a copy of the Nyurjung Munlam for Kibji Gelek Doji Chang and you were one of his students, it would be very good if you could include it in your morning and evening practices. If you're one of those people who follow the Tibetan tradition of Tunshi Naljor, four sessions a day of meditation, <laughs> then it's good to do four times a day. Gyawa di nyardo da, kebji gilek, mutrup gyurne, drawa chikyung malau pa, te sala gubar sho, janjo semcho, rimpo che, ma ke pana gigur chi, ke pa nyampa me pa yong kone, kondu pelwar sho. Thank you.